Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we come together to learn more about getting started with Visual Studio Code Spaces. My name is Hussam Mohsine. I'm the Program Manager for Microsoft Reactor in Abu Dhabi. Microsoft Reactors are hubs for founders and developers to meet, learn and connect to local peers, as well as industry leading ideas and technology from Microsoft, partners and the open source community. It's also home to the Microsoft for Startups program. With a diverse mix of hands-on workshops, expert panels, and community events, there is something for everyone. Check out our calendar of events on meetup.com and join our coming sessions. Our speaker today is Rory Preddy. Rory is a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Rory's focus for the last few years has been research and development with a focus on cloud research, consulting, and training. His work in research got him deep insights into industry movements, trends, and news. Rory heads up the Middle East and Africa accessibility pillar for Microsoft, speaking and inspiring on how to empower everyone in every organization to achieve more. Feel free to ask questions during the session. We will have regular stops to answer these questions and also feel free to tweet about the session and tag us on Reactor Abu Dhabi. That's the hashtag on Twitter and uh, that Twitter handle is MSFT Reactor. And also you can uh, adjust the playback settings to select the highest quality for the best experience during the session. And with all that said, I hand over the mic to our speaker to start the session. Hello everyone, um, hopefully you can hear me. There's a lot of moving parts to my demo and my talk. Coming from uh, sunny South Africa, all the way uh, at the bottom of South Africa, and uh, a, a topic um, that is really exciting and um, really kind of uh, um, hot off the, the tongues of uh, developers right now is remote development. We're all kind of in the, the same situation and um, I'm uh, really, really uh, proud to present you this and I wanna just thank uh, Hassan for uh, hosting me. So quickly, just a little bit about myself. I'm a senior cloud advocate. Um, my pillar that I focus on is accessibility in Java. Um, so, so reach out to me if you have any uh, Java questions. You can follow me also on Twitter. And let me just change my screen now so you can actually see my uh, slide decks. Let's do that. And I'm going to now going to uh, change uh, my screen. Uh, there we go. Add content from below. Um, let's change the screen. There we go. So now you can see me and the slides that I have, which is great. Um, so let's start the slideshow here and I've got my nice little Lenovo pen that uh, I'm gonna annotate in. And the, the thing about annotation is it, it, it kind of gives me something to do at the same time as talk to you, which is which is great for my attention. So yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at, uh, at Rory Pretty. And we're going to do Visual Studio Code Spaces today. And now another name for Visual Studio Code Spaces is Visual Studio Online. Uh, so Code Spaces kind of is the uh, keyword that we use, but we've, we've had this product open for quite a long time, but this is really the, the, the newest rendition of this product and allowing us really to take advantage of a, a lot of new technologies that has come to uh, fruition in the developer ecosystem. Most importantly is WSL. And WSL was, uh, WSL2 was announced in build and you'll see how we're using WSL for some really, um, really innovative ways to, to uh, cater for remote uh, development. Agenda for today, we're gonna go, what is VS Online? We're gonna look at uh, security and how, why this is a, a valid form of uh, development and secure form of development. Configuration, how do you configure your ecosystem? Um, pricing, so all of the different pricing tiers, um, and then we're going to go through a demo and if everything's working. The demo should work fine. I only whacked my development environment three times today. So uh, let's let's hope um, and pray that uh, it does. And then we're going to look at a roadmap. Obviously, everything is exciting, some, some exciting features coming up. 
we're going to look at a roadmap that we're going to uh, show you so you can get some excitement. Trends. So recently I ran a, a remote hackathon with two and a half thousand people across Middle East and Africa. And we, we, we kind of wanted this for twofold, this remote hackathon. One is to engage with all of the communities and audiences that we had. And two is also to kind of get a, a feel for exactly what people are, want in the communities. What are they, what are they actually uh, looking for? But we, we, we know uh, roughly what they're looking for. One is that we still have microservices, Ma microservices, monolith services. You know, the, the word is so interchangeable. Well, sometimes, um, you know, uh, we, we don't actually know what microservices, but we still have this term of microservices, especially with containerization and Kubernetes and all of these terms there. Um, the trends are still today mi um, microservices, the ability for developers to actually couple their uh, functions and, and go serverless or Kubernetes and uh, deploy to cloud-based uh, infrastructure. Then we've got open and inner source, so uh, distributed source, uh, Git, uh, GitHub, you know, uh, Microsoft is one of the largest contributors to open source, but we also, we're, we own GitHub and it's the home to 50 million developers right now. So, and that's a big trend to move your source instead of hiding it in this little uh, dark corner in, in someone's stiffy drive to uh, look at collaborative uh, development. And then uh, we have distributed teams. Well, we are distributed because, you know, uh, right now uh, we, we, we are, uh, in the COVID climate, and we, we have to come up with the, the new normal, which is working from home, working from office. Some of our team's uh, members are here, some of them not. And then time to market, always been a pressing issue. We need to actually look at how do you deploy it. You know, in Microsoft, we deploy 160,000 times a day um, using our DevOps. If you remember that DevOps session that I did, um, so time to market. And, you know, all of these really couple into remote development. So that's, there's a, a huge drive uh, to, to actually um, help remote devs uh, to uh, take advantage of uh, all of these different services. And um, we, we also kind of realize that there's something else that, 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 they, that we need to actually cater for you. You as a developer, you as an individual, you, you make your lives easier. Um, if you do hear my dogs or kids in the, in the background, this is also the, the, the new normal um, uh, working um, at home. So what is VS Online and uh, why is it important? So first of all, manage environments for any project. You want to rinse and repeat. No longer, uh, I remember when I worked for a, a development company and they said to me, okay, cool, uh, we'll, we'll expect you to start working in two weeks. And I go, why? They, no, it'll take you two weeks to start up your development environment. And I thought, no, that's, that's absurd. And no, it did. It really did take two weeks to actually start a Java and scripted environment to get everything running up. And we want the managed environments every project. You want to be able to say, hey, um, development team, I'm going to create a snapshot and image and here's your image and start. You don't want to be reliant on your development environment, the, the perfection of your development environment to maintain your code. You also want to feel at home even when away. If I'm running in a RDE on my PC, why is it difficult for me to just say, I want this IDE now in the cloud and need to connect to it and use it from anywhere or another developer take over from it. Feel at home even when you're away. Develop from anywhere. Have you developed from your uh, smartphone? You should be able to develop anywhere that has a terminal. And that's really what we, what we want to see. Um, laptops, PCs, uh, smartphones, anything that has an internet connection, we want you to be able to feel creative. You have a, an idea, go develop. Supercharged collaborative development. We want you to be also CIDC, plugged in with the, the, the DevOps uh, cycle. So no longer do you have to worry about, oh, it's just, is the build, is, um, is, is my test running? Uh, collaboratively connected to your team, to your CICD process. So what is a dev environment? And, and it's an important question because I, I actually did a talk uh, about four years ago on uh, the move of the change of pace with development environments. Now, typically what you have is the, a, a matrix. So a dev environment, um, your IDE caters for one or two languages and it caters for one or two platforms. And uh, we call this the, the matrix of complexity. So we have platform, and then we've got language. And, and as you actually choose a, a platform, you don't necessarily choose uh, an underlying language. 
your environment should actually choose all of them. And that's very difficult to do. And uh, what Visual Studio Online allows you to do, and it was revolutionary at the time, it catered for something called a language server. And a language server allowed you to cater for uh, multiple tools running multiple languages. And how it does that, it has an off-process JSON-based server. And I'll show you when I run my language server now. Um, but JSON-based server that actually runs your language for you, plugs into your IDE. So your IDE no longer has to worry about um, your, uh, your language of choice. And then it sends uh, to and from JSON uh, messages. And we had this great idea, wait a second, with this in de development environment locally, why don't we actually put that language server in the cloud so you can connect to it? And that really is the, the novelty of Visual Studio Online. But more importantly, what is the dev environment? Let's look at what the case is. So first of all, you've got an editor, a code editor, something that can actually have IntelliSense, something that can have uh, code sense and be able to help you refactor and write code efficiently. Then we have your source control, so uh, Git being of, uh, the, the source control of choice, but connecting to there and managing your issues and your, your, uh, your pull requests. We have your runtimes, which I mentioned, your language server, and that should be able to cater. You should have multiple runtimes, Python, PHP, Java, .NET, all of them running in the same project, actually. You have your debugger, your packages, and then your tools. Your terminal, so your Git or Bash or your CMD terminal. And finally, your extensions, which is uh, your uh, language server extensions and your config. And these extensions, uh, as I mentioned before, these actually uh, extensions uh, tie in to your runtimes there. Because what we realized there with the extensions, we needed to create with a, a local dev environment. We also need to create remote extensions. And remote extensions, if your PC is running in the cloud, then you actually send your extension information to your local PC. So let's start with the development review. So you've got your environment and you, you have your customization um, and your personalization for you. And with uh, Visual Studio Online, it allows you to create all of these different environments, access it through any of these browsers, and your editor of choice doesn't actually have to be Visual Studio Code. We also have in public and private preview Visual Studio. So you can connect to your network, which has your compute, which is your underlying uh, compute power with your storage, with all of your different VS Code environments. Let's go through the, the compute code. So, Infrastructure as, as source, platform as source, and service uh, um, software as a service. So infrastructure as a service is your, uh, your virtual machines. Platform as a service is your platform running on top of that, your uh, .NET Core, your Java, and then finally your service as a service. So Visual Studio Online actually runs on top of infrastructure as a service with a platform on top of it. So it's actually hosted um, in Azure. And what it does, it actually runs a small little VM underneath that. So you get, you actually get full control over the, the underlying uh, VM. So you get the virtual machine isolation. And what is nice is that I get a full virtual machine. I can choose how many CPUs, I can run certain software on it. Um, and I get the isolation that I can actually ensure that only the ports that I, I want are actually uh, opened. I can environment uh, cap, uh, customization. You can see there um, your own custom Docker file or image. Because the VM itself here, yeah, it's not only a VM and you get access to the VM, but it runs a Docker container. So you can set everything up. So your, your team lead, your, your development lead can set up your entire Docker container to cater for each one of its teams. And you can kind of tweak it for each uh, team member. And if, you, if you're selling, uh, smelling what I'm selling, when it runs locally on your PC, you know, the revolution of WSL is that it's not actually Docker that runs this. It's actually WSL because Docker run, right now runs on WSL2. And then finally, composed environments. So you can use Docker Compose, you can use Docker in Docker, Dockerception, or, um, or you can just use a plain Docker file to actually run your database, service layer, REST layer, test layer all in one virtual machine on one environment. 
There are no public IP addresses, and you'll see when we do the demo exactly what we do. So they do port forwarding, but there's no public IP addresses, so they're not accessible via IP addresses. And that's pretty nice because it also saves you the hassle of actually having to worry about security in that round. No inbound traffic, so um, environments um, are uh, outbound only, connected to an Azure relay, end-to-end -end encryption, authenticated and authorized. You can do um, multiple different connected clients and they connect to the relay, eliminate intrusive change to firewall network infrastructure, and then obviously hybrid cloud. And I'm gonna show you how to do a hybrid cloud also, which means that you can connect with virtual networks, you can connect with your, your local infrastructure. For storage, um, yeah, so we've got Git as the single source of truth. Um, you can actually connect to other providers. You've got dedicated storage per instance. So each environment runs its own uh, dedicated storage account, which is mounted to the actual VM uh, when active. You can actually connect it to file-based storage also, encrypted at rest. And then your safeguarded secrets, so you can use Azure Key Vault for your safeguarded uh, secrets. Permissions, so you can use Azure subscriptions and resource groups for your permissions to organize across cost centers, uh, division and users. You can also use RBAC for your Visual Studio Online plan. So I have uh, about six or seven plans running right now, and um, I'm linked this uh, to my uh, VS Essentials account, but you could also uh, link it to any one of the VSO plans. You have your audit logs also, so you can uh, get um, auditing on exactly what and uh, when people are spending. And let's look at config. So GitOp is, is the new keyword. So you've got config is versioned in Git. Uh, Git credentials are proxied by the client, not stored in an environment. They secure by, by default. And this is a, a, a how you actually configure uh, another element. So I, I spoke to you about Docker, right? And Docker is the underlying VM. There's something else that you do with the config. You, you create something called a dev container that JSON. And a dev container that JSON, if you know anything about Visual Studio on uh, Visual Studio, um, Visual Studio Online takes the dev uh, container to JSON and configures your Visual Studio instance to cater for um, the, the specific config for each one of your Visual Studio Online. So you can actually say, hey, listen, install the Java plugin for in Visual Studio and run it on a Docker container with Java. Connect it to Docker, cost control. So you can actually have basic, and we're going to go through the pricing now, standard premium, or soon to come GPU. And you can do auto suspensions, means that you won't actually incur hidden costs. And then obviously network security group, we're going to see how you can open ports there, uh, protocol or ports. Where is it currently available? We've got it in uh, uh, United States, Europe, coming to United Kingdom, Asia Pacific, and Australia. The pricing. Um, I always go with the premium pricing because I'm lazy and I need power. Um, and uh, you've got the basic tier, which is two tiers. Uh, it's about 25 cents uh, an hour, uh, 46 cents for uh, the standard tier. The premium tier, which is my baby, I always go with that. And it's really powerful. If you're worried about your laptop performance, you should see how these things perform. And then the GPU, uh, which is coming soon, which actually has a GPU process to do all your machine learning and AI. And um, there's also another one in private preview windows. And I've been using this extensively for that. And it's, it, it runs on a similar pricing model. And it means that I can spin up an entire Windows 2019 server environment and run all my Windows processes on that without having to uh, you know, um, uh, affect my laptop. Is your hosted and then the editors. You can also over here, which is pretty important, you can self host your Visual Studio um, containers, your dev containers. We're gonna look at that now uh, for a demo because sometimes you don't really want the cloud-based system to do it. You just want to, you want to host the cloud in your PC. And this is where, this is where it gets a little bit mind boggling because now it means that I can uh, run my project locally. I can run my project in a cloud-based self-hosted locally, or I can run my, uh, my project with a remote connection to my cloud-based IDE um, running in the Azure cloud. And there's so many different options. And that's really what you want when you give developers the options for remote connectivity. Um, you want to not limit them to the desk that they are and they can move about. 
So in the demo, um, let's go through the demo. First of all, I'm going to show you and go through the project on GitHub that I've created and some of the other projects you can do. I'm going to show you my local environment, uh, connecting to my local environment, what it looks like, the project. Then I'm going to show you the, the dev container that I create inside uh, my Visual Studio Online. I'm going to touch a little bit on uh, dev, DevOps. And then we're going to go back and do a, a review on code spaces to see exactly uh, what you can actually do a little bit more. So let's let, let's start here, and I'm going to uh, go into Chrome. And on Chrome, I've got my GitHub repo. That's my uh, my profile there. And I've got quite a few nice little uh, repos there. But I thought to myself when I was creating this this demo, I thought, Rory, uh, you can go for the simple solution, or you can actually show them the uh, the solution that everyone is on uh, wants to know about: uh, serverless and functions, because you are a Azure Cloud Advocate focusing on Java, I've chosen functions with Java running in Azure. So let's let's get a look at that. Now I've cloned this, I've forked this from um, the uh, Microsoft VS Code Dev, con uh, dev Containers uh, repo. If I go uh, VS uh, Dev Containers, uh, let's go VS there, and you go in there, they have a lot of nice templates that you can actually run. Any language you can think about under containers there, uh, they have, they've got uh, Ansible, blockchain, functions for the different languages, um, Linux, Dapper, uh, Docker uh, with Docker Compose, Java 11, uh, Java 12, uh, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, TypeScript, anything that you can kind of think of, they kind of have uh, for these dev containers. And what the dev containers actually allows you to do is that it gives you these two folders. If I go here. So it gives you these two folders, dev container, um, and then the, the source. And in this, the dev container, you've got dev container, JSON, uh, and then the Docker file. So let's go first into our Docker file. So this is going to create our VM for us. Uh, let me make it a little bit bigger. And the Docker file is pretty simple. It basically just says uh, from uh, that uh, source image there, just, uh, yeah, well, basically just that, just from that source image. I haven't really added anything, but you can run run app get, you can install a lot of other uh, uh, scripts onto that. You can set uh, passwords, uh, connect to other services. And then once the Docker file is completed, then it calls the dev container.json. And the dev container.json sets up your underlying uh, VS online uh, IDE. And my extensions that I've got there, I've only got three extensions. I want to do the Azure functions, so I'm going to deploy functions. I've got the Java functions and the Java debug. And then the remote user I want is the VS Code Docker user there. That's that's about it. And then obviously I've got my project, which we, we're going to go through here. My project is just a very basic uh, Java function that I've got. Uh, it's got source, main, function, the Java. It, it's really pretty simple. And it just kind of says get, uh, get a, uh, a get request and then just go hello hello and then that's the name of that get request and it's a, a java a serverless function and you can hit it there we're going to deploy this and we're also going to have a look at how to actually create a uh, a, a vs code uh, uh, instance so the easiest way to do that is uh, look at this little button here it says vs code create now if i click on that yeah this is black magic and it just goes in i need to sign in so I'm going to have to uh, sign in uh, there. The token expires every two minutes, which just frustrates me uh, on a lot of times. So let's go sign in. The ping pong for AD authentication. Just going to have to go back to that Git repo once it's finished sign in. Okay, pitching my code space. Let's go back to that Git repo. Okay, now I'm signed in. Now that's tokenized. So I hit that again, and then I just pops up and says, "Fetching your billing plans, logging you in there." Create your code space. I'm going to call that test. Uh, got my code space name, the Git repo that I selected. The instance type, I can choose uh, premium Linux or you can choose uh, Windows. Um, and then uh, suspend or uh, idle, I'm going to do two hours. And then dot files is another little script uh, which you can actually do. And you can script it before it actually uh, creates it. And then you just go create. And obviously, uh, I, I'm a professional demoer, so I've actually created a uh, instance that I've, I've got working just in case this one uh, doesn't run. And you'll see there, uh, initializing code space. The first thing it's going to do, it's going to create your Docker instance, not set up your uh, VS uh, online uh, just yet, your IDE, but it's going to initialize the co uh, code space. It's going to create that Docker image. Remember, we, 
or that doc image is just a very simple image file that uh, we pulled from a repo for Microsoft image. And then it's going to go, once it finishes that, it's going to go into the uh, VS Online and it's going to build your entire environment, which I've actually uh, preempted uh, over there. And then we, we can actually come back to that. Oh, there we go. Uh, so it's building your container. It's going to pull the layers. Then it's going to run the container. And when it runs the container with the doc instance, it's going to take that dev container file and it's going to load those three extensions that I had um, and all of the settings that I had into my underlying uh, VS uh, online environment. And you can see now also why I like the big CPUs because this runs on Docker um, on a uh, like a, an instance on uh, Azure linked to your account. Not like a little bit of power. If you if you go the basic tier, it can take a few seconds to run up there. But um, yeah, so I like to actually do this, especially when uh, it comes with demos. You can see they're starting uh, code spaces. And it's going to now bring up my IDE. It's going to set up my IDE with my underlying functions. You can see I've got a, a backup there just in case. Uh, always have a backup in, in demos. Or best yet, actually, screen recorded in a video and then just press play. But what's the excitement in that? You want to you have a little bit of adrenaline uh, rush. Else, else, what's this for? Uh, okay, so then this will come there and you'll see there that it's actually starting the project, but you can see they're opening remote. If I go through uh, opening remote, uh, the log file will actually show that it is creating my doc instance. It's uh, instantiating it. And then when it finishes there, it's going to come back with this project uh, that I have over here. And this project here, if I go into my source files, is that function that you have there. I've got my palm, I've still got my uh, dev, uh, dev container, but uh, dot JSON with my underlying uh, Docker files um, and then my, my VS Code settings if I want to change and everything. And then I've got my, my actual IDE editor here. Uh, can add some new extensions. Uh, and I've got my remote explorer here, which we're going to come back to. So let's just see if it's finished there. Attempted to reconnect. Let's actually. Okay, let's leave that uh, for a few seconds. So this is my project and this is my functions. Now, the first thing I want to show you is that this actually runs on a in a Docker instance and you can actually close this uh, this connection via, if you see here, uh, code spaces here, you can actually close it. Okay, you can't actually see it there. But when I look at my local PC, you'll see that this is actually running in a, a, a Docker instance. And it's running uh, your... Uh, all of your settings that you need to run your functions. And I've got my, let's clean this, this, this up here. Let's just clean that. I'm gonna start my functions. Okay, let's go there. I'm gonna start my uh, functions here. Um, and it's a, just a, a little emulator locally. So I wanna test it locally before I deploy to uh, Azure. I wanna go uh, MVN, this is the live demo part. Um, and uh, and I want to go Azure dash functions. The S part and functions always catches me. And I want to go colon run. And this will take all my code there and I'll run a local emulator that I have, a serverless emulator. But I'm running in the cloud. So now I've got my emulator running here. And I can and if this was running on my PC, it would be localhost. But I, I, I've got a cloud IP. So why can't I actually connect to this via a port? in the cloud and you can. So if I go to my, my Explorer there, you can see there that I've opened up port 7071 um, in my actual functions, in my dev container actually specified. Uh, let's go back there quickly. I'll show you what, I'm, what I mean. And I wanna go to GitHub, github.com forward slash OEP forward slash functions. And remember the, the dev container, I actually could have done it there, the dev container dot JSON, it had the ports that I wanted to open. So the port that I have open there is 7,000, uh, what was it again? 7,001. So I've actually defined the port there. So I can go back into my IDE. So it did come back the other IDE there. And you can see there it, it created everything. Let's go back to the one that I was working on. And I can go there and right click on that port and I can go open port in browser. And it will do port forwarding onto the cloud, linked to my local host, and I can actually get people to test on my PC anywhere in the world via my IDE. So this will this will come back uh, eventually. Uh, I just need to put the full URL in there. I should actually go back there. It says that, but I need the 
full URL, if I remember that correctly, it's API, uh, HTTP example, and my name equals to Rory. Hello, Rory. And it's using, you can remember there, it's not actually using IP addresses, it's using hashes to actually go in and do port forwarding. And now you can code anywhere and get people to test anywhere in the world, if, as long as you've got the, the port open. So let's go back there. We can can that there. So that's the one part of the demo that I wanted to show you, how easy it is to actually go in and you can see my environment here, it's finished creating and I can uh, go in and I can do the exact same on uh, this uh, environment because the port's open. Let's just close that because it's gonna get confusing. And then I've got all of my, uh, my logs and everything and I can create a new terminal and if I, uh, I create a new terminal, it's it's a full Linux environment. Let's just go file, terminal, new terminal. It's your full Linux environment. So I can go uh, PWB, and I've got my, I'm running as root right now, but I can run anything, and this is a Linux environment. I can create any Docker instance I wanted, even Windows. Remember, I could actually have a drop down there, private preview of any Windows environment we want. Now, I've finished my, uh, my uh, my work uh, in my office, I wanna go home, but I wanna to connect to this environment, this exact environment from home. How, how do I do that? Well, you've got Visual Studio uh, on my PC here, on my laptop, and I'm gonna click through that, and this is the project that I actually just checked straight out of uh, GitHub, and you can see I've got my project here, but I wanna to connect to the same instance that I had running in the cloud. Now I've got a remote explorer, you can see there that it shows that I've got my functions running there. And that's the online cloud IDE um, that uh, we, we just created. And I can right click on that and I can go connect to code space and it will go and connect to it and run all of the uh, extensions that I had remotely into my laptop and allowing me to access the file system and also the underlying uh, uh, VM as if I was running on my own PC. And how does that do that? Now, I'm gonna show you how it does that. I'm gonna go into Portainer. So Portainer is a nice little tool here that you can look at. It's like a, a Docker image uh, viewer. Um, and uh, if I look at localhost containers, what am I currently uh, running? Okay, so it hasn't actually started it yet. Uh, okay, well, when it actually does start it, I have, a, I have a, a, another quick way to actually get it. Let's start another instance. Uh, let's go to Visual Studio Code Insiders. We're gonna create another instance, and now we're gonna do, uh, that did come back then. So this this is actually running in remotely uh, via that. It doesn't actually create a, a doc instance. Sorry, I got that wrong. It actually just connects remotely to that instance. So you can see there, it's actually connecting uh, remotely. But I can do it one more, one more way. I can run that entire VM, that Docker instance, locally on my PC. So I've got my, my other uh, VS Code instance running here. Let's close that. Okay, this, it, it doesn't like those things. So I'm gonna uh, just close this here. I'm gonna go file, close remote connection. And then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna say file, open folder, and I'll connect. This is the, the actual Git repo that I have here. Select folder, and what it's gonna do, it's gonna go, wait a second, this has a dev container and a Docker file here. Do you want to open this in a, uh, a Docker instance locally on your PC? So not really connected to the cloud like I showed you there. Uh, let's say yes. It'll give it a few seconds and then it'll say, uh, I've picked up a, a JSON. You can see they're activating extension. Now these are activating extensions locally on my PC, but I wanted to actually pick up the, uh, the, JSON, the JSON container file here and say, Go and create, yes, reopen in container, go and create a Docker instance on my PC. So I can simulate the entire way that Azure runs it on the cloud locally on my PC. And then you'll see here on my uh, Portainer instance here, when I click on refresh, it will create it in container on my local PC and I can click on that. And it's the exact same thing that we ran in the cloud. And now I've shown you all three ways that we've done this. One, I've shown you the way that you can actually start uh, with Visual Studio Online with the IDE via all of those different templates that you can start with um, and port forwarding and you can do uh, debugging even. Um, two is that I've shown you how to actually connect to this remote instance. And three, I've shown you how to actually connect to a Docker instance on your local PC simulating the cloud. The last thing I wanna show you is DevOps. 
So obviously, there's multiple ways to do DevOps. With Azure Functions, it has built-in DevOps in there. So this is our Azure Function, and you can actually go into Azure Functions. You can go to uh, Deployment Center, and you can link through uh, with your Deployment Center to your, uh, your GitHub uh, connections. You can uh, link through to your Azure DevOps uh, connections also. But you can also do that via your and deploy, and we're going to try to do that. You, uh, you can deploy it via your cloud-based systems. So here is my, uh, and it'll come around eventually, um, configuration, so when this is uh, starting. So let me, let me show you while this is taking a few seconds. So that's starting my dev container and my Docker instance. And this is running on WSL2. And how do I know this is running on WSL2 on my local PC? And it's pretty quick. If I go into Docker, and I right click on Docker, the latest version of Docker, if I go into settings, go into my Docker settings, there's a little tick box there on Docker settings that you may have not noticed. And it's use the WSL2 based engine. So this isn't actually running on Docker, it's actually running on Windows. And the nice thing about that with WSL2 based uh, locally before we do the deployment is that if I wanted to connect to the instance here, it's running Ubuntu. So I can either go into Ubuntu, but I can also go uh, view command palette WSL. I can uh, connect to my WSL new window, remote WSL. Uh, let's go retry. I think I'm trying to do Docker and Docker and Docker. So let, let's try and uh, close that remote connection there. And rather start off uh, here, and we want to go uh, view uh, command palette, uh, WSL, uh, remote, go remote, remote, WSL new windows. This will open the Ubuntu instance that my Docker containers are running. Okay, the demo doesn't, doesn't like that part though. But basically, you can actually do that uh, with it. I think there was an open folder or some other connection that you needed to do. And it runs locally on your instance there and on the Ubuntu uh, version here. So this is the, the Ubuntu version here. And this is where my container is actually running. And this is the, the speed there's about 20% improved there. You can see better performance with the legacy Hyper-V backend. And Docker now has partnered with Microsoft to actually uh, do that. So let, let's look at uh, the final step there is um, DevOps. So one, let's close all these windows here, welcome. So the easiest way to do uh, DevOps is actually connect to it uh, via your deployment center. You've got Azure repos, GitHub, and uh, Bitbucket. So you can start off there. Okay, we know this is on GitHub and you can go uh, continue. You can use Azure Pipelines or uh, Azure Kubernetes uh, build service. So I've already done Azure Pipelines. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with how long that took, but uh, uh, let's show uh, you Azure Pipelines. So I'm going to go into my Azure uh, Pipelines, uh, Azure Microsoft DevOps Pipelines. And I created just a very simple CI CD that every time I check in a file there, um, it will actually uh, bring up and build it and run the test. So I actually do have tests that uh, check uh, the validity so of my uh, uh, service there. If you go into test, you'll see there, it's just a basic test there that says, uh, test that uh, the name, if it's Azure, it actually is Azure when, it's, uh, when it comes back. Um, yeah, so let's go back into okay, sign in. I've got my Azure uh, DevOps organization I've already created. And I created a CRCD. Now, every time you check into GitHub, uh, yeah, take me to your Azure DevOps organization. You can also do this with GitHub Actions, and there's a lot of preloaded functions in Java uh, tooling that allow you uh, to do that. Okay, create a project. Now, I've already got one. I've got my Azure Functions there, my organization, and my project. I've got my little dashboard, so if my tests fail, I can actually see uh, what's failed in my little dashboard there, and hopefully it hasn't failed, actually. So let's just see here. Uh, let's see my tests. And it does come around. Um, so while this is happening there, let's go look at the actual pipelines. 
we can see our pipeline there. Then I've got my functions on nine. Last time I ran it, it was four hours. And then this just basically connects to my GitHub repo, runs it, it's all built in. I didn't have to write a single bit of YAML code because no one likes YAML. Uh, I've got my job there. And you can also do a deployment there. And it's got the checkout and maiden, and it's got running my, my uh, test there. You can see there, let's go right down to the bottom. Uh, yeah, so r test run, uh, remaining one, test ID four. Yay, it worked and we can go and see that in the, the dashboard. Only 15 minutes for questions for you guys. And I can, I can kind of see there, yay, my test run and there's no issues there. So everything's connected. You can connect it via your Azure functions. You can also, when you do a deployment, you can deploy it via your normal uh, Azure kind of uh, plugin here. So this is connected to my Visual Studio Enterprise account. And if I wanted to just do a, a basic deployment, um, I can just right click there and go uh, deploy to function app and it will actually go in and uh, deploy it. So there's so many different ways to execute. There's so many different ways to actually code. The world is your oyster. You can now code in your local PC, code in your local PC with the container, code in your local PC remotely connected to your VS Online container, uh, remotely code uh, using VS Online, rem and even uh, remotely code on VS Online connecting to your local PC. And all of this is a, a debuggable and also multiple language. So there's so many different ways that you can actually now start on this journey with Visual Studio um, Online. So let's finish up the, the presentation and we can uh, do some Q&A. So the roadmap. So uh, we've just finished build. We've got basic and GPU instances. So GPU instances on private preview, shareable plans, Docker Compose support, secrets management, VS Code, setting sync. And then in summer, we're looking at Windows environments uh, making a public preview. The VS, uh, so Visual Studio IDE support, so something I didn't show you is I could have done all of that via Visual Studio, not only Visual Studio Online. Uh, in fall, we're going to go the general availability of all of the features, offline environments, retention policies, VNet support. So to bring everything in and everyone into the same VNet, audit logging, and then in winter, full Windows environments, and then the full VS ID support. To, to know more, to click more, you can go acca.ms forward slash VSO dash docs. I'm going to leave that up there for your um, uh, you can click through with your, your camera phone. You can get started now with VS, Visual Studio Online, uh, public preview with all of these browsers, and then obviously uh, private preview with Windows containers and Visual Studio, and then I have a general availability for LiveShare and IntelliCode. Another talk that I would love to give actually on IntelliCode and LiveShare and show you how to do uh, live sharing coding uh, practices. Okay, so let's open it up uh, for some Q&A. I'm gonna open up the Q&A.